One thing I've noticed in Thailand when the Johns get old, their Dharma talks tend to focus more and more on the essentials. When you're younger, you have the time and the energy. Talk about all kinds of things. But as time gets shorter and shorter, you get a sense that you want to get the essentials across. You have no idea how much longer you're going to be around. Of course, this applies throughout life. But as you get older, you get more conscious of it. There are two themes that the Ajans would tend to stress as they got older, especially true of Ajan Suwad. One was taking refuge in the Triple Gem, and the other was being really serious about your actions, about the principle of karma. And these two teachings, of course, are very closely connected. When you take refuge in the Triple Gem, even though the Buddha said that we have to learn how to depend on ourselves. He gives us advice so that we can shorten that process of finding the truth. And he allows us to borrow his wisdom so that we don't have to keep on reinventing the Dharma wheel ourselves. He left his Dharma, and he left a community of people to carry on the Dharma. And that's our refuge. Without that, we wouldn't know how to develop the right qualities so that we could learn how to depend on ourselves. And those qualities come down to being very careful about what you do and say and think. Be very heedful. The heedful implies they are dangerous. But it also implies that you can prepare for them and protect yourself from them. If there are no dangers at all, there would be no need to be heedful. And if you couldn't do anything to protect yourself from those dangers, well, there wouldn't be any need to be heedful either. You just have to accept whatever. But you can make a difference with your actions, and those actions can have long-term consequences. That, you may remember, is the question that lies at the beginning of wisdom and discernment. What, when I do it, lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And anybody can recommend ways of finding happiness pretty quickly. But if you're wise, you want long-term, and you realize it's going to have to depend on your actions. And you also realize that long-term is possible. Sometimes we tend to forget that with all the emphasis on the teachings of inconstancy, stress, not self. Everything changes, changes, changes. An image that some people like to use is of someone sitting on the shore, and the waves come in. The waves come and go and come and go and come, and there's nothing you can do to stop them. You know, it's kind of silly to think, well, this is a good wave, or this is a bad wave, unless you're a surfer. But otherwise, you just learn how to accept the fact that the waves come and the waves go. But that's not an image the Buddha himself ever used. He says, we're crossing across a river, and there is safety on the other side, and it's reliable, truly safe. The river we all have to cross. If we don't cross it, there's danger on this side, and if we don't cross it well, we get to fall into the dangers of the river. But you can learn how to take advantage of what you've got here. You've got this body, you've got this mind. You can take the good qualities of the body and the mind. You can make them into a raft, and you hold on to that raft as you go across. You don't let go. You let go only when you've gotten to the other side. So we do have these potentials within us to find safety, to find something that is long-term welfare and happiness. So the Buddha sets that out as a possibility. And that's one of the most valuable parts of his teaching, just opening that possibility. There is a way to put it into suffering. And the world tells us where you can assuage or manage your suffering, but there's no way you're going to totally end it. The Buddha is saying something else. And the fact that he gives us that message is important. That's one of the ways in which we borrow his wisdom. 
and he gives instructions. The Eightfold Noble Path it boils down to virtue, concentration, discernment. This is the path. He gives instructions. Virtue in terms of right speech, right action, right livelihood, concentration in terms of right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Discernment in terms of right view and right resolve. He spells it all out. Now there are a lot of areas in which you have to take his principles as general principles and you apply them in your own specific way to your own specific problems. But there's always a test. Do these does your way of applying them actually work? This is where the Buddha's wisdom is really interesting. He doesn't just set out a teaching. He also talks about how, how you go about hearing the Dharma, how you go about learning how to listen to the Dharma, how you think about the Dharma, and how you apply it. So it's not just the teachings. He says, this is how you find them. You try to look for someone who's a person of integrity. And it's interesting that the Dharma can be passed on only from a person of integrity. And the Buddha's standards for finding a person like that is that, one, you have to have some integrity yourself, and two, you have to spend time with that person, you know how that person behaves in different situations. Is the person reliable? Does the person have endurance, admitting learning how to live with setbacks in the world and taking them in stride. You ask some questions, would this person ever claim to know something he didn't know or she didn't know? If the answer is yes, find someone else. You're testing the truthfulness of that person. Another question, would this person ever get someone else to do something that would not be in that other person's good and best interest? And again, if the answer is yes, find somebody else. You're looking for someone who's compassionate. And the third is, are this person's teachings subtle, refined, reflective? If the answer is yes, okay, that's someone you want to hang around with. You're looking for someone who's, who's wise, so truthful, compassionate, wise, and knowledgeable. Look for someone like that. And then you listen to the true Dharma. You know the true Dharma is true because it aims at dispassion, freedom, or being unfettered in the Buddhist terms. It gets you to be modest, content. Contentment here means contentment with the requisites of life. It doesn't mean being content with whatever's coming up in your mind. And you shed your pride, you shed your thoughts of getting wanting to get back at people, your demands that I'm not going to get out of here until justice has been done. Those things have to be shed. In other words, you focus on the qualities within you that this path develops. And then you also focus on how it influences the way you deal with other people. You want to deal in such a way where you're not burdensome on other people. And you don't entangle yourself with them all the time. You find time for seclusion. So for the Dharma, when you put it into practice, it develops these qualities within you. Then you know it's a genuine thing. But then there's the question, well, how do you put it into practice? First, the Buddha says you have to apply appropriate attention. That means learning how to ask the right questions. How does this teaching apply to my life right now? And first, you have to ask yourself, is this teaching consistent with what I've learned in the Dharma before? Because that's one of the hallmarks of the Dharma, is it is consistent. We've heard so much about paradoxical Buddhist wisdom. But when you look at the early teachings, the Buddha is really consistent in saying certain things are skillful, certain things are unskillful. There are areas of the path where it does get a little bit paradoxical, but those are the very advanced ones. 
A lot of people want to go straight to the advanced levels, skipping over the basics. But the basics are important because they train you to be a reliable person, train you to be the sort of person who can apply the teaching. So you reflect on the teaching, you see that it makes sense, fits in with the Dharma, and then you decide, okay, you want to practice, whether it's a desire. And then you judge your actions. This is where you move into the fourth thing that the Buddha talks about, which is practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, you, you set the Dharma as your standard. You don't set your ideas as your standard. You take the, you're willing to submit to the Dharma. It's a word we don't like to hear, submitting. But again, think about the Ajans as, it, as life approaches its end. They always expect a lot of gratitude for the Buddha. And John Chow once said, if you really understood the Buddha's teachings and really had benefit from them, every time you bow down to the Buddha, you'd have tears in your eyes. Because he'd gone to such difficulties to get this Dharma out there, and it is so valuable. So you take the principles of the Dharma, and you know that they are the principles because they aim at disenchantment dispassion. In other words, learning how to outgrow your old habits, the things that you do, kind of playing around, looking for immediate happiness, and ending up with long-term pain. Learning how to say, I've had enough of that. I want something better. In other words, you stick with that principle, long-term happiness all the way through. This is how we take refuge in the Buddha, not only listening to his dharma and saying, yeah, the dharma is true, and agreeing with it. We learn how to recognize, well, what's true dharma? What's the kind of person who can teach the dharma properly? How we should ask questions about it. See how it applies to the problems of how we're creating suffering for ourselves, and how we can stop doing that. And that's when we understand the principles, then we follow them. It's in following them that you become a better and better judge of whether things are working or not. I remember reading an article one time, printed in the New York Times, so it was supposed to be reliable. This person saying, well, I tried mindfulness a couple of times and it didn't work. Well, one, were they really mindful? And two, were they really a good judge of what works and what doesn't work? Because working sometimes takes a long time to see whether it really works or not. Some people say, well, I understand the principle of karma, and yes, I agree with it because I've seen it in my life. Well, you've seen shadows of it. You've seen indications. I took the Buddha, the ability to remember many, many, many aeons back to see, yes, the principle of karma really did work that way, because it's very complex. The principle is simple, but it's working out as complex. It's kind of like one of those fr fractal equations. The equation itself looks pretty short and simple, but as you plot it out, you see it gets very complex. When the Buddha talked about other people who had gained knowledge of previous lifetimes, what he called a short memory was 40 aeons. And an aeon is a whole universe, from the beginning to the end of a particular universe. That's a long time. And for that, the Buddha said it was still short, which is one of the reasons why it's good that we do borrow his wisdom. And so it would take a long time to reinvent the Dharma wheel. And in borrowing his wisdom, we learn not only what he had to say, but also his advice on how to listen to it, how to think about it, how to put it into practice. It's all laid out. Now, he does require that you be sensitive in how you apply it, because you'll discover that many times his instructions are like riddles. You read the 16 steps in his instructions on breath meditation, and they're pretty simple. You detect when the breath is long. You detect when the breath is short. You train yourself to breathe in and out, sensitive to the whole body. And then you learn how to breathe in a way that allows the breath to calm down. The ideas are simple, but how you apply them in practice requires that you put a lot of yourself into it as well. 
So in judging the Buddha's teachings, it's not just a matter of deciding, well, it sounds nice to me, or it doesn't sound nice to me. You have to put a lot of yourself into it. How do you let the breath grow calm without stifling it? How do you maintain your focus and be aware of the whole body at the same time? How do you breathe in such a way that gives rise to pleasure, breathe in such a way that gives rise to refreshment? Instructions are there, but how to do that depends on your using your own powers of observation. And the Buddha said what you've got to do is, one, commit yourself to the practice, and then two, reflect. So the commitment means okay, you're willing to take on the teaching and try your best to do it, and then learn how to reflect on the results. Are you really getting the results that are good? And if not, what's wrong? And the wise people say, there's something wrong with how I either listen to the Dharma, or how I'm thinking about it, or how I'm applying it. They don't go criticizing the Dharma. They have to ask themselves, okay, what am I doing wrong? And that's when you have hope, or there's, it's when there's hope for you. And that's how you become your own refuge. Not by, not by placing the blame outside, but saying, something is wrong inside. But I have the ability to fix it. And I've got the help of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. I mean, these principles of finding a person of integrity, listening to the true Dharma, applying appropriate attention, and then practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. These are the principles that the Buddha says can take you all the way to the first level of awakening. They're basic, but they can take you far. So don't overlook them. There are people here that, at first level of awakening, you cut three fetters, so they try to cut them. Once you gain insight into whatever is subject to origination, is subject to passing away. So I basically tell them, says, well, I'm going to just believe that as much as I can, skip over the causes. I'm trying to get to the results without doing the causes. It doesn't work that way. The causes may seem mundane and very ordinary. But if you really apply yourself to them, and you really reflect, they can take you to a state of mind that will cut the fetters for you and put you in a position where that insight into whatever is subject origination is all subject to passing away naturally occurs without having anybody ever told you that. And think about all the people in the time of the Buddha who had that insight, and some of them were pretty unlikely characters. They were the, I guess you wouldn't call them hired guns, the hired bows and arrows, who were hired to kill the Buddha. He was, able, he was able to teach them, and that was the insight they had. And in teaching them, he didn't mention that phrase at all. He taught them about the Four Noble Truths, the truths with their duties. So you do the duties as they're set out, and you commit yourself to them, you reflect on them, so that they become more and more your dharma, not just the Buddhist dharma. And that's how you move from taking refuge in the Buddha, dharma, and the sangha into taking refuge in yourself in a way that's really solid and secure. <laughs>